нема сенсу представляти професора у Снайдер, бо інакше б не записалися. Я тільки ради експерименту, чисти експерименту спитаюся, хто прочитав, бодай, одну книжку професор Тімоти Снайдер, підніть руки. Ну все, ну, нема сенсу мені щось говорити про професора Снайдера, ви всі його добре знаєте. Я скажу тільки ті зв'язки, які є в Азюку. Ну, а ви знаєте, одна з фотографій, яка пішла дійсно вірусною, це фотографія нашого студента Олександра Шерш, Шерши, який в окопі прочитав читав книжку Тімоти Снайдера. Професор Снайдеру часто представляє себе, коли питають, хто він такий, він каже, що він і фандрейзер для УКУ. І це його спеціальність. Але він також і фандрейзер для України, ми це знаємо. Він зібрав великі кошти для України, а взагалі ми маємо щастя, що маємо такого доброго великого адвоката України, який виконує, не побігся сказати, роль таких міністерств за кордоном. І це велике щастя. Але в мене є такий знайомий, який дав найкраще означення е- професора Снайдера. Він не українець. І не працює в Українському університеті. Він сказав, що ми всі живемо в часи професора Тімоті Снайдера. І це є часи, маємо щастя, що маємо Тімоті Снайдера, але ми живемо, але також дуже тяжкі часи. Ви це знаємо, ми це бачимо. Це часи війни, це великих викликів, великих загроз. І професор Снайдер, власне, приніс, приїхав, тому до нашого він зараз готовий книжку, має книжку, яку ми хочемо з нами поговорити, власне, про це. Але я думаю, що ще одна книжка, це буде розмова з ним. От зараз. Отже, я пропоную такий варіант. Ми зараз маємо тільки сесію питань і відповідей. Я дуже прошу вас, буде мікрофон, говорити мікрофон. Поки зараз ви будете думати на питання підносити руки, то я маю таку заготовку. Ми просили наших солдат з фронту, наших аспірантів, магістрантів, студентів, які на фронті. І вони підготували свій список питань. І може я почну із того списку. Я працююся, що... Очевидно, ви знаєте, що професор Снайдер вільно говорить українську мову. Він каже, що вже й розуміє, але також і говорить. І перше питання, яке найчастіше повторюється. Що робити з Росією? Як буде виглядати світ після війни, як буде виглядати Росія після війни, і що Захід мав би зробити в цьому сенсі? Перед усім вітаю, поздравляю. Я дуже щасливий, що я можу бути тут з вами. Um, дякую за запрошення. Я, я буду говорити англійською, тому що um, я, я, я більш інтелігентний англійською, ніж українською. Um, але як, якщо, якщо ви хочете задати питання українською, це дуже прошу. So, um, what о, oh, і, і це, це для мене було дуже, дуже, дуже приємно um, чути пана професора Грицака, як, як він говорив українською, то звичайно, я не маю таке. Та... <laughs> я би радий так говорити англійською, як професор але, 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 але за, за паном Грицаком є, є, є трошки так, що, що він um, в, в кожній мові говорить так само, <laughs> таким самим стилом. Um, so what what to do what to do with russia um it's a i mean it's a, it's a, it's it's a hard question because i am I, i'm aware that from a, from a ukrainian from a ukrainian perspective uh it's it's it, 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 it's very difficult to think about russia right now and very difficult to imagine to imagine what a russian perspective might be i mean my my very simple answer is that there isn't really a tension between what Ukrainians want and what Russians need, which is for Russia to lose the war. There's, there's, really, there's really no way that Russia wins except by losing. And there's no way that Russia can... That the only historical chance for Russia to lose an imperial war is right now. And so what to do with Russia? I mean, after, after the war is over, it's very unpredictable for all of us. But the best thing that can happen for Russia is for Russia to lose, to lose this war. That said, I think we shouldn't think or talk too much about what, you know, whether Russia should fall apart or whether you know, that's, up, that's up to the Russians. The best thing that we can do is, from the, from the, from the point of view of the West, we we have begun a process of reconsidering what russia is and that process of course will seem frustratingly slow to you but that process is very much underway 
um, it seems frustratingly slow to me too, but it, it is it is it is underway. So I, I I think that you know the thing to do with Russia is to defeat is to defeat Russia, which is the only thing which gives Russians a chance. Дуже дякую. Прошу питання з публіки. Десь тут має бути дівчинка, яка має з мікрофоном ходити. Прошу піднімати руки, щоб я бачив. Прошу питання. Вже я буду виконувати роль красивої дівчинки. Um, okay, so my question is not really on the topic of uh, war in Ukraine, but um, a, a, you're, as a university professor, I would like to ask you, um, it is often said that in Western European universities as well as in Northern American right now, um, the education is highly ideologically determined, you know, and... Um, like uh, something in Ukraine that happens in terms of war as well. And I just wanted to ask you, do you think that uh, educational space, which university is, should be a safe space for students in terms of uh, ideology or more a challenging space, like uh, a place when uh, like everybody like can ag agree with you on certain terms or more a place when you have to defeat your, um, <coughs> defend <laughs> uh, your uh, views constantly. Okay, ja wypowiadaję ukraińską. Tomu się, nie, to tomu się moja wypowiedź jest je, je dużo prosta w tej sytuacji. Nie edycja przede wszystkim proces, co wy zaraz aktualne dumajecie. Jaka je wasze zdanie polityczne i logiczne? Co nie, co nie tak ważliwe? Ważliwe je co, co wy na uniwersytety uczyć się dumacie. Dumacie, peredumacie, analizowacie. I tym, i, 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 i tym samym uczyć się zmienić zdanie. <laughs> Bo nie macie racji. Te, co dumacie zaraz, nie macie racji. Через п'ять років будете мати іншу думку про дуже, дуже багато речей. І, і так має бути. Наш, наша праця професорська полагає в цьому, що ви маєте краще думати. Очевидно, факти важливі, так, так, так є, але думати краще, думати краще. І завдяки цьому Треба, потрібна є, потрібна є конфронтація, так, потрібна є незагідність, але не, не про це, що було неприємно, тому що без конфронтації немає не не, не думки, так. Więc, so I don't think it's supposed to be a safe space or a confrontational space. It's supposed to be a place where you, you become a better thinker than you were. And that means sometimes that I confront you and sometimes you confront each other. But it's very important to, th to remember that confrontation is not the point. Okay? So in, in, in our universities, in our universities the, the people who criticize the safe space are often trying to create a confrontational space. They're, they're trying to take the university away from the professors and just make it a place where everyone fights all the time, right? And that's not the goal either. So in this, you have to be very careful navigating these American debates, right? Because the, it's, what, what I think is that the university should be a safe space for people to change their minds. It should be a safe, because if you, if, you, if you leave university thinking the same things as when you arrived at university, then someone has failed. You know, maybe it was you, maybe it was your professors, but somebody failed along the way. Питання від аспіранта Микола Гайового з фронту. Чи не дається вам, пане професоре, що західні інтулали після Другої світової війни виховали слабку людину? Людина, яка не готова жертвуватися життям за країну, за націю, бо на дворі вік постгероїзму, постнаціоналізму, постмодернізму? So... I'm going to be a little dialectical in my answer here because it's, I, I, so it, it's, it, I think it is important that there are things for which we risk our lives, but it's also important to know what those things are. So there's, there, is a, there is a balance here. It's, it's, I wouldn't want 
you to all be educated to think that the most important thing is to sacrifice your lives. I would want you to be educated to think there are things for which I would sacrifice my life. So there's, there, there is a balance, and you can, you can make an error in, in either direction. You can raise young people so that they're too ready to lose their lives. That can happen too, right? That, that, that is possible. And there are times when young people risk their lives when they shouldn't risk their lives. And there, and there are times when it's a very difficult decision what you should be doing, even on the level of what is best for the nation, right? So I, 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 I take the point, but I mean, for me, I, I wouldn't say it's, it, it's not so easy. It, it, the answer is not that we all have to be more ready to risk our lives. I think the problem, I mean, in this way, I'm going to sound like you know, the, the great conservative that nobody in the West thinks I am. But I think the, the, problem is, the problem is more in the West, um, the, 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 the lack of the metaphysical, right? Like the consideration that there are things that at the end of the day we'll make sacrifices for, even if that's not the sacrifice of your life. It might just be the sacrifice of your convenience or the sacrifice of your career or the sacrifice of something. That's what I worry about on, you know, going back to your question, the, the pre previous question about ideology, I mean, I, one, it's, it's not a matter of the far right and the far left in my country. In the, both, often both the far right and the far left are ultimately about convenience. Like they're ultimately about the lack of responsibility that, you know, we, 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 we are sure, we're sure that we don't actually have to do anything because really we're just going to criticize everyone else and that's going to be a substitute for actually doing things. Um, and um, so, uh, and the second thing I would say about this is that you know, the West, Zahid, like the, 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 is my situation the same as a, the situation of Germans? You know, the Germans are in a different position. Is my situation the same as the Spanish? I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's also important to realize that, you, you know, Ukrainians in 2023 see the world differently than they saw the world in 2013. And I know because I was there. And you see the world differently than you saw the world in 2003. You know, and I know because I was there. And you see the world differently than you saw the world in 1993. And you weren't there, but I, but I was, and I, and, I, and, I, and I remember. So I think you know, another way to phrase this question would be to think, you know, Bolobitak Svornovate Pitania, Jaka je ukrajinska vidpovidalnist, što vyjasnite pevne reči, tak svanomo zahodove. So like, what is, what is the Ukrainian, like, given your experiences, what do you have the responsibility to explain? Because it's, it's important not to fall into the category, not to fall into the mistake of saying, well, the West is decadent, right? Because once you say the West is decadent, then it's like the West is lost. Right, it, decadence always precedes a final collapse. So you don't want to think that the West is decadent. You want to think, okay, we we've learned we learn from the West, and what do we teach the West? Because like that's, I mean, in 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 my life, that's how it is, right? Like I I try, like I try very hard to learn from you know my friends in Eastern Europe, my friends elsewhere. Um, you know, and I've also tried very hard to, to teach. And I think we're, you know, we are at that stage where it's a, where we have things, you know, you have things to learn and we have things to learn from you. And so the moment when you think, okay, the West is decadent, the West raises these weak people, I sympathize, I understand. But I think the way to reformulate that is how would we explain the things that we have to explain? How would we explain the things that we have to explain? <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, uh, we all uh, have seen the scene of Nancy Pelosi uh, coming out of the Congress, crying after the speech of Zelensky. And it seems to me that there is a demand for some heroes in the public sphere, in the po politics or something like this. Do you think like that? Or maybe it may be explained in the other way?
Well, I, I think around around Zelensky, there's a kind of mystery that. Well, yeah, I mean, no, I, 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 there's there's a kind of I mean mystery in sort of the serious sense of the word, like that. When when Zelensky remained, and this speaks to the question about about the West, and it, and it also in a way speaks to the question about universities. When Zelensky remained, does not but yak 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 when Zostal v is President Tut, right? When when he stayed in Kiev, that was mysterious. Like there was a, a there was a mystery. I mean, mystery in the profound sense of the word. There was a mystery around that, because we. I, I don't mean me, because I actually said that I I said publicly, no, Zelensky's going to stay. Zelensky's going to stay. Zelensky's going to stay. But nobody else thought that, right? And so when he did remain, it was a mystery, and it's a it's it, and that that mystery is connected to the larger mystery of Ukrainians fighting and not surrendering. And and so for for Americans it, the mystery is and again it goes to these questions about values why you know why did he why did he stay right? And because we have one of our problems is we would like to think of freedom and democracy as being produced automatically. They're produced automatically, we want to think, by God, by the Constitution, by American exceptionalism, by capitalism, by something, but by some larger process that brings them to us, like a consumer good that is delivered to us. The, there are many problems with thinking that way. But one problem with thinking that way is that the moment you face a crisis and it looks like freedom and democracy are not being delivered to you, then you run. You run. Because you don't think of freedom and democracy as something which have a kind of character, a, va a character of value, right? A character where you have to commit to them, like they have to be part of you and you have to commit to them. And so I think that you know, the mystery for Americans was that we didn't understand that people could actually do the things that we talk about doing, right? I'm being a little bit unfair to my people, but not much. That we, like, that, and so when Zelensky stayed and when Ukrainians fought, there, the good people in, in the U.S., the, 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 the good people were astonished, Again, in the like they like they knew that this, so they knew this was something special, but they lacked the words for it. They couldn't say why it was special, right? It was, and so there was a sense that okay, Zelensky has done something that we wouldn't do, right? But no one could quite say that directly, right? Zelensky has done something which crosses our parameters of what's normal, of what's possible, even. And so for the good people, and I would include Biden and Pelosi in that, for the good people, this was, a, this, was like an, this was a kind of example. And then, you know, for the people who, for the people who like a dictators and, you know, for the people who like Russia, it was painful and intolerable because they, you know, the people who like force, the people who want to be told what to do, for them, this was really, you know, this was, this was a kind of horrible blow. And we have those people too. So what I would say is that it's, I'm not sure I'd go right to the word heroes. I think it's more, it, it's more about being forced to recognize that there is a kind of sphere of value in the world and that there are people out there who actually take that seriously. And for my, for my country, this is, a, I would say, a weak spot because we, you know, we consider ourselves to be a very free country and, you know, we're kind of in the middle, actually. And we consider ourselves to be a great democracy. Eh, you know, our democracy is okay, right? And we talk, we talk a lot. I don't know if you've noticed this about us. Um, but we talk a lot about freedom and democracy and how great we are at it. And so when that talk 
was when, when, when a nation which is used to talking encounters an action which is mysterious in this way, it has the kind of effect that you see, like of Pelosi, Pelosi for example, crying. But I want to say that this is basically a very positive thing, um, that the, it's positive in the sense that a lot of Americans are starting to, you know, there's, they recognize that what Ukrainians have to do, are doing has to do with freedom. And that's making them rethink what freedom is. It's reminding them that freedom is something you have to actually take some kind of action for. That freedom involves responsibility to act and not just the delivery of something to you. You know, it's the freedom isn't good luck, it's, it's, it's action. And that's true for everybody. It's, not, it's true for you, but it's true for everybody. But it's also positive in the sense that it is, the, the Ukraine is now the one subject in my country, really, where almost anyone can, can converse with almost anyone. Right? And, that's, and that has to do with the sense that you know, something, something indecent is happening and that the way that the Ukrainians react, or the, the way Ukrainians are reacting has something very human about it, which means that regardless of our political convictions, we can often, we can often talk about it. So heroes, I think it's more like examples. Like, the, hero is a very dramatic word, you know? I, and I think it's maybe more like examples, like just seeing that people lean out a little bit into, you know, this world of value that is very that is very important. That's very, that's that's very important. It's also very important, by the way, that and, and this goes to what I said about the previous question, the decadent West. It's very important that Ukrainians have not just acted but spoken. So it's very important that Zelensky talks, that he keeps talking, that he keeps trying, and it's very important that Ukrainians in general try to communicate with the with the Americans and with and with everyone else. That's also a very important part of it, because you know it's Zelensky coming to Washington. There's the truth about it, but there's also the way that he spoke, and you know the symbolic things that he did, right? The flag from Bakhmut and so on. So, uh, so during the era of fake news and past truths, did you have a turning point in your life when some myth was destroyed? And your point of view on the world was changed dramatically after this event or after discovering some knowledge or some truth. I don't know. That could be a very personal question. Uh, so I'm... I guess I'm I'm older than you know I'm older than fake news like I'm 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 older than you know I'm older than the iPhone I'm older than the internet and I my own perspective going back to the question about Russia my my own perspective on this is a very Russian one so like my my I've written a lot about Digi the, the digital digital fascism and the problems of the internet and my perspective has always come from russia like that is the russians kind of show us what can be done so i i mean i don't th have i ever made mistakes and learned of course but in the in the, it, with the, the the what i what i think i understand about the fake news is that um, there is both there's a there's a productive aspect to truth and there's a metaphysical aspect to truth and there's a social aspect to truth so the productive aspect is that you have to have journalists in universities and like you have to actually produce facts like you have to raise facts just like a like a farmer like they don't like you if you just if you don't plant the seeds and you don't water, you know, and you don't till the soil, nothing comes from the ground. And facts are like that. They don't just emerge automatically, like people have to actually work for them. And, that, and so U Ukrainian journalists, and not only Ukrainian journalists, but Ukrainian journalists are very important people because without Ukrainian journalists, the world wouldn't see this war in the same way, but also you wouldn't see it in the same way, right? So there's a factual aspect 
And then there's, there's a metaphysical aspect, which is that we all, like, we have to believe that things are true, at least in the sense of a horizon, that we approach the horizon, that we can approach the horizon of truth. So, like, the whole question, you know, what is true? Is anything really true? Like, these kind of postmodern obsessions. I think, you know, you, you, you Marcy, Marcy Shores made this point, you know, but I'll just make it, I'll make it myself anyway, that Ukraine has helped a lot of us get past that. I mean, that, that was never my way of seeing the world, but I think Ukraine has helped a lot of us get past that, you know, I, and back to the sensible position, I think sensible, that truth is there as a horizon. You, you never may actually get there, but pers you're a different person if you pursue it than if you don't pursue it. And the person who says, I'm not sure what is true, but I'm trying to get there, is a very different person than the person who says, what is truth, who knows, everything's possible. And so there's a metaphysical quality to truth. But then there's also a sociological quality to truth that we have to prepare one another to be able to listen to things. And again, this goes to your question about universities. Like we have to prepare one another to listen to things that we don't want to hear that might be true. And how do we do that? Like that's, that's work, that's institutional work. How do we, if somebody believes in a conspiracy theory, you know, or if somebody believes that Putin is a wonderful leader from your point of view, like how, it, how, do, you, how do you talk to that person? Right? How do you how do you reach that? How do you reach that person? So there's an impure, there's like a productive quality, a metaphysical quality, and then there's also the sociological quality. I'm talking to you about the things that I think I've learned from the era of fake news because for me, like the era of fake news is, I really see it as a continuation of other things, and I think you know, and for me personally, the 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 the, the dissidents of the 1970s, um, the from from Eastern Europe. Who were, con who were working on the problem of propaganda and conformism and so on, had very useful things to say about this. Like everything which I've said, they basically already said before the internet, right? Before the internet, right? So Miroslav Maranovich is smiling, but he's an, he's an example of this, of this generation, you know, where what matters is taking care of the actual facts and being able to, you know, being able to take risks for the truth maybe small risks, but risks, but also creating institutions. Like, you know, back in the day, it was, um, you know, Samvidov, is that the Ukrainian word? Uh, that, you know, the, that creating institutions that allow other people to, 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 to hear the truth. But I think, like, when I think about fake news, I just think of, I mainly think of it as a kind of mechanized continuation of earlier problems. Um, and that we have, you know, and that there are thinkers that we can return to as we as we try to confront it. I'm I'm dodging your question about what I got wrong and how I, what I what did I get wrong that I've changed my mind about? I think the things that I have wrong are mostly about my own country. I think the thing like there's, I think I've learned, I think I've, you know, I, I think I've learned about the United States. I've never been. A, I'm an American and a historian, but not an American historian. Right, like my friend Tony Jett used to say, he was an American then a Jew, but not an American Jew. Um, so I'm am an American historian, but I'm not an American historian. And in in a kind of interesting way, like as I've been as I've tried to explain the, like other things to the Americans, I've learned I've learned more about I've learned more about America, and I think I understand I understand some things about the inequalities in my own country better now than I did. so because it, like in a way it goes back to Russia, where I think Russia shows us certain extremes. And then I always try to ask, are we going in that direction too? <laughs> right? And then and the answer is often yes. And then so I try to think, okay, how can, that, how can that be stopped? But I think race and wealth inequality, those are the things about my own country which are more important to me than, than they used to be. Еще одне питання з фронту. Так. Що робити з населенням Донбасу? Після того, як Донбас буде реокупований. Питання з фронту. Я. Але на населення, як є актуально ще на Донбасі. Тепер так. Яка має бути політика щодо нього? Питання по Донбасі, що крім трошки інакше. Донбас. Я. Я маю, це... One wants to recognize one's own limitations. You know, I, I haven't been to the Donbass since since the early two. I haven't been to Donbass since 2013. You know, I haven't been to Donbass for a long time, and I've listened to people who've come from the Donbass. But I mean, one and I have friends and students who are from the Donbass, 
but it's it's a little bit hard to imagine things when where one hasn't been. My my general I mean my general instinct about Donbass and Krem, or my general analogy, is you know, West Germany, East Germany, that you know you the the way that you win people back. It, it, in the way you win territory back ultimately is by being the better version of yourself. So that, you know, it's, it's actually historically not so normal, not so abnormal to be cut off from parts of your territory. That happens all the time. It, 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 and the, the, but in the way, the way that you win people back is by being the better version of yourself. One of the things that the Germans got right is that they were the better version of Germany for decades. One of the things that they got wrong is that they said, we're the better version of Germany. <laughs> so getting the population of Donbass back is going to be, it's going to be a process that takes patience. And, it's, and I think one has to start from the assumption that it's going to take patience and that just being right about things isn't going to be, isn't going to be enough. But also that especially important, especially, especially important are going to be the children and that like the, and that parents and grandparents can often agree, even if they disagree with you about politics or what, even what Ukraine is, that institutions for children are very important. And so that, that may be the, that may be the place to start. Tanya, прошу, прошу вас. So first of all, I'm glad to see you here. And my question is about leadership. During these turbulent times, we can see how important uh, it is to have a strong leader. In Ukraine, we have Zelensky. But what about the rest of the world? Uh, what is the current situation with leadership in USA and Europe? Who do you think is a strong leader nowadays besides the Ukrainian president? Tanya's Thank you. Election, election. <laughs> So I want to I want to take that occasion to talk about Zelensky, because I mean I think in this room there are probably a lot of people who three you know th three years ago, two years ago would not have said that Zelensky was a strong leader. In fact, I heard a lot of them you know say so, right? And so I think we, before you know bef before we jump to the idea that he's a strong leader, I, I want to reflect a little bit about what it is that makes him. A good leader, because I, I think that I think there's some really interesting things about him as a as a as a person, which may be instructive for the 21st century. So, one one of them for me is that he's not trying to do everything. So the the some if you think strong leader, you might think that's someone who's at the top giving orders to everyone about what to do. But he's not actually trying to do everything. You know, he he he's not, for example, in general, making the mistake that Putin makes and trying to tell you know the the army what to do. And he also, you know, he, he also generally acknowledges the role of Ukrainian civil society, right? So one version of a strong leader would be, I have to have control over all of the institutions, and that's not how he's playing it at all. I mean, he understands that there are thousands and thousands of little groups that make up Ukraine. And so one of the reasons why Ukraine, you know, as a state is stronger now than it used to be is that for civil society and the state are more or less pushing in the same direction. And that's something good about civil society. But I'd also, I would note that it's also something good about the president, that he's generally letting that happen. And of course, he, he should continue to generally let that happen, right? Another thing which, so when you think of a strong, like when you use the word strong, you might think, okay, this is somebody who, you know, always knows his own opinion, and, but that's not him either, you know? I mean, so lots of people have had contact with him, but I, I was very impressed when I, I talked to him during, you know, during the counterattack in early September, and I, I was really struck by it. So he was the president of the country and there's a, you know, there's a war going on and it's the counterattack and like how to keep, how, you know, how to keep, they're, they're in how to keep Scott Oblast and like minute by minute they're taking back more territory as I'm talking to him. But he still is very happy to say, and I've talked to, I talked to a lot of important people 
but he was, he was still very happy to say, so what do you want to talk about? Right? Proce vi hočete rozmavlate, right? And so I said, you know, ja, ja hoču rozmavlate pro filozofia svobode. And he was like, otak. And then we did it, right? And that's what we talked about. And so the ability to like pivot and adjust to the other person, but also the ability to listen, right? The ability to listen. So I'm just, I'm messing around with your idea of strong leader a little bit because I think, you know, the, the, to be a strong leader of a medium-sized country in the 21st century involves a lot of different kinds of skills and that we should probably, you know, we should, we should be noting what those things, what those things are. And then obviously communication, um, that he tries really hard to figure out where other people are coming from. And you, I, you know, you, and I see that you know, every time he encounters different kinds of foreigners, he's trying to figure out where they're coming from. So he doesn't really talk down to people. You know, I mean, he, like he exemplifies a certain kind of pride in his own country, but it's more like pride in country rather than I'm the most important person in the conversation. And so that's, that's, really, that's, that's really interesting and that's really, that's really important. And it makes him... And so when we, like, so when people use the phrase strong leader, right, they might mean Putin. And so we have to ask, like, what is it that is so different between a Putin and a Zelensky? Like, and what is it, like, and what is that? Because, you know, Putin tells people what to do, and he's always right, and he never makes mistakes. And, you know, so that's one version of what a strong leader is. And, and if people said, and... When people talked about Putin for years and years, that's what they said. They said, well, maybe Russia's a mess, but they have a strong leader. And so now we have to ask ourselves, okay, how, what do we mean when we say strong? Like, what, is, what does that mean, strong, right? What does it mean to be a strong man or a strong woman or a strong leader? And so, you know, that, I'm pausing on this because I think it's very important to ask because Zelensky didn't go from being like, he changed when Russia invaded, but... You know, he had certain capacities which turn out to be really important in this world that we're in, that we're in now. And so when I think about Biden, you know, uh, uh, who I think, by the way, is a historically excellent president. I think that, you know, I, don't think, I don't think America has had a better president since, since, since Roosevelt. Um, and when I think about, like, why, like, what is good about Biden, it's, it, there is some overlap. Like, he's obviously a different character. He's much older. But... When the war in Ukraine started, he didn't. He he tried to persuade everyone that it was real, and then he asked for help, and that was very different from traditional American behavior, right? Traditional American behavior is we can do it on our own, right? You know, we're going to do something like we're going to invade Iraq, and maybe you're going to come and maybe you're not, but we're doing the right thing, and maybe you can come along. Whereas what Biden did, and this is very important, is that he told the Europeans, like, this is going to happen and we can't handle it on our own. And he's completely right. You know, we can't handle it on our own. And that was very important. And so, like, when you ask, you know, who's a, who's a, who's a strong leader? I mean, I'm translating that kind of into who's a good leader. But he's actually done an incredibly good job in, in, keep, in, in, in making, you know, in a lot of different ways that are maybe less visible over here. But in keeping the Ukrainian war in, in the center of American politics, he's done a really good job. And it goes also back to the ability to change your mind. So Biden is not, you know, he's not a young man. Um, and one of the stereotypes of older people is they can't change their minds. But on Ukraine, I've watched him change his mind on a, 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 several times already. And that is really, that's really important, right? Because what if he didn't change his mind? Like, what if he thought the same things now that he thought two years ago? Then your situation would be very different, right? So I'm, I mean, to be clear about my own position, I'm constantly frustrated with the American government. I constantly want them to do more faster. I constantly think you're too slow, you're too slow, you're too slow, you're too slow. But when I look at it with some distance, you know, th th this is actually quite good leadership. This is actually a strong leader. So where, where else in the world are we, you know, are, we, are we finding good leadership? Well, it's mostly like women who are in their 30s. <laughs> I mean, they, like the spectacular demographic, the, the, the thing which European parliamentary systems allow, which our system doesn't allow so much, where younger people can become ministers of government or even prime minister, mean that you know, the most impressive leaders, I think, in, 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 our, you know, in our Western world, um, are in places like Finland or Estonia or Slovakia, 
um, and even in Germany, right? I mean, not, but in, I mean, because some of the ministers in government in Germany are actually very impressive people, younger, younger people. Um, so uh, that's, I mean, the, 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 the strongest, I mean, it's, it's interesting how, you know, in this world where this 70 year old man has started this war, a lot of the people who are most articulate about the war outside of Ukraine are, you know, younger women who are prime ministers, who are, other, who are ministers of government. Uh, so that's, 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 the best, that's the best I can do. Професор, я хочу подякувати вам за курс про Україну, який ви розробили і викладаєте. Моя сім'я за вечерю слухає цей курс, найменшому слухачу два з половиною роки. Я вас вітаю, ви успішно конкуруєте з мультиками. В одній з останніх лекцій, які ми дивилися, ви сказали, що європейські країни останні війни свої програвали. І моє запитання таке, як цей досвід програшу впливає на їхню поточну зовнішню політику зараз? This is the, this is it. Okay. So when I say I have a different theory of Europe than the Europeans do. And so my my work on European history is actually directed against the narrative of the European Union. Um, because the narrative of the European Union is uh, not about defeat, but about peace. Whereas I think defeat is very important. So what happened in May of 1945 to the Germans was not peace. What happened in May of 1945 to the Germans was defeat. A very broad coalition defeated the Germans, absolutely defeated them. Their leader committed suicide. Um, the, the surrender was absolute, and things changed. So, I, I when I so when I think of the German peace movement, I would like for there, you know, what I would like is for there to be a German defeat movement, where Germans say it's very important for empires to be defeated like we were. Like that's the lesson I would like for them to learn from their history, because peace. I mean, we all want peace, but the question the question is. How do you? How does one get there in a world like the world that we live in? How do you get to peace? Okay, peace is not the, obviously the same thing as surrender, uh, and so sometimes peace means victory, and sometimes it means you know defeat for one side and victory for the other side. So, when I make this argument that Europe depends upon military defeat, I'm trying to remind the the West Europeans, if you will, about the thing which they have suppressed from their own history. So in their story of the European Union, there was a second world war, and then everybody realized war is bad, and so they started trading with one another. Whereas what really happened, in my view, is that Germany lost an imperial war, which was mainly about Ukraine. The French lost their colonies in Southeast Asia and North Africa. The Portuguese and the Spanish lost their colonies in, in, in Africa, and so on. And that after losing wars, they settled on Europe. But Europe also became the excuse not to remember what actually happened, right? And so during this war, and before this war, I've been working very hard on my view of European history, partly because I think it's true, but also partly because I think it's important to inform politics. Because if you think about what Russia, what Russia is doing, you know, Russia is, is, in my view, we can talk about this, but it's carrying out an imperial war. And when I said earlier that the only, the only way Russia can win is by losing, this is one of the things I had in mind, that the empire has to lose its last war. You, always, you have to lose your last war and you have to know that you've lost it before you try something else. And, and so for the, for the West Europeans, I, the, the, my answer to your question is, I don't think they realize that the European Union is about defeat. I don't think they realize that, and that's why I'm trying to make the point all the time to them. I think that I think the Germans in particular have to understand that they, they fought a colonial war and lost it, and that everything that they have now begins with that defeat, with defeat precisely. And that therefore and by the same token, we have to wish the Russians defeat 
We have to, even if, even if we care about Russia, right? I realize that, you know, I understand I'm speaking now to Ukrainians and this is not the first thing on your mind, but to all the Germans who care about Russia, if you care about Russia, you need this war to end quickly and with a clear Russian defeat because that's the best, that's the best chance for Russians going forward. So uh, the, the, this war, you know, in a number of profound ways, this war has made you Europeans return to the Second World War and return to their own myths of origin and hopefully confront them a little bit. Because it's like, this is one of the, like Ukraine, since 2014 at the latest, I mean, Ukraine has been a way of communicating, I think, the actual history of Europe. Because Ukrainians have understood they have to, because of your position, they have to understand, okay, we, we're going to go from empire to integration. Like, that makes sense. We'll go from empire to integration. Integration helps us build our state. Our state has problems. Integration will help. And that is what happened to the Europeans, too. That's what happened to the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Italians and the Poles. They had, they had one kind of imperial problem or another, and they solved their imperial problem by joining the European Union. Right? And Ukrainians, I think, intuitively understand that that's the choice. Like, it's either, either one or the other. And the Russians, by the way, also understand this in a different way. You know, Putin understands this, either integration or empire. And he's choosing, he's choosing empire. And so uh, I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to get Europeans to understand that integration has to win. It goes back to the question, I mean, your question about America, and I was trying to explain how we have a story about how freedom and democracy just happen. And the Europeans have a story about how integration just happens. But it doesn't just happen. It happens because people lose wars. <laughs> It happens because of other dramatic things, which you then forget about later on. Yeah, thank you so much. It is a question from the front, from Mikola Pisenko, the historian. And he asking about the Chinese president recently visited Russia. And we see that the partnership is getting stronger and growing. So. What is China's role in the Russian-Ukrainian war, in your opinion? And is it a temporary um, like, axis of uh, Moscow, um, Tehran, and Pekin? Yeah, how do you think? Thank you. OK. So uh, first, I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you about something which I think the Ukrainians need to communicate yourselves because it's really important for how Americans and Europeans see the world. So what, what are we worried about? What have we been worried about in the 21st century? We've been worried about China. And how have we been worried about China? One of the ways we've been worried about China is that China is going to invade Taiwan. Now, thanks to you, we are less worried about that, but we're not giving you any credit for it. So one of the things that, so the, the, the logic is that, that because Ukraine has resisted Russia, it's less obvious to Beijing that they can just walk into Taiwan, right? Um, I mean, if Moscow can't just walk into Kiev, well, then maybe Beijing can't just walk into Taiwan. It's going to be a lot harder. So. This is one of the many ways that Ukrainian resistance has made the world actually more peaceful, less risky. So we in the West, going back to your question or the, 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 the question from the front about our decadence, um, you know, we in the West have a way of making everything about us, right? And, um, and so when there's a war in between Ukraine and Russia, one of our impulses is to, is to think, oh, that's very frightening. And then we kind of change the subject to our own fears. But in fact, the world has been made more safe, on my view, a lot more safe by this war. I mean, Ukrainians talk about how you're, you're sacrificing yourselves for other people. I don't even, I think sometimes you don't even realize how true that is. Because it has, it has effects all over the world. And one of the most important has to do with China, precisely China, that we are now less afraid of that scenario. We're less afraid of that scenario. 
and I think you, you, what I'm just trying to say is I think Ukrainians should be pointing this out, that there are many ways that you're making the world more safe. One of them is China. Another one is Europe. I mean, that, you know, we were, the, the, the whole scenario of a war between NATO and, between NATO and Russia is pretty far-fetched right now. Who are the Russians? I mean, Finland could, I shouldn't say things like that. <laughs> but the idea that Russia is going to invade Finland now, for example, right, is preposterous. The idea that Russia could invade Poland, there's no way, I mean, honestly, there's no way they could handle the Polish army now. Um, even the scenarios of moving into a single Baltic state are a lot less frightening than they were a year ago. And that's all because of Ukraine, right? So Ukraine has made Europe much safer. It, 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 the rest of Europe, you know what I mean. You, it's, made, it's, made the, it's, for, it's made the lives of the Germans and the French and the Spanish and so on much better because there actually is almost, there's much less risk of a, of a war in Europe because you have basically absorbed the war in Europe on your own territory. You've absorbed the Russian army on your own territory. And that makes the, re I mean, the rest of the Europeans might talk about how scared they are, but in fact, you've made Europe less safe. And so while I'm on this theme, I'm going to add nuclear war. So w the people in the West, you know, sometimes talk, sometimes go for Russian nuclear propaganda um, because we like to think about how maybe we're the ones who should be scared. But Ukrainian resistance has actually made nuclear war much less likely. Um, because what, Ukra what the Ukrainians are doing is they're showing that nuclear blackmail can be resisted and a war can be kept conventional. So that's a longer argument. But basically what I'm trying to say with China is that if I were a Ukrainian talking about China, the first thing I would say to my Western partners would be, you know, you realize that we have made this much better for you than it was before, because you have. And we are not, we are not going to say that. We're not going to say that. I mean, we need to hear it, but we're not going to say it. Because from the point of view of America, like, we're, you know, we're a great power and China's a great power and whatever happens in China has to do with us. But actually there are things that you can do that affect China that we, that we could never do, right? You have reduced the risk of a war over Taiwan in a way that we could never have done. And you've done it without confronting China at all. Right? There's no direct confrontation with China. On the contrary, I mean, Zelensky keeps talking in Ukrainian official position is we would like better relations with China. Come visit. Why not? Right? Okay, the second thing about China and Russia. One has to remember that the Chinese really don't care about Russia. I mean, from the point of view of, from the point of, view of Beijing, Russia is just like a big African country which has natural resources and there, you know, Russia is there so that Russian domestic elites can be bullied and manipulated, just like they bully and manipulate African elites. That's how they see Russia. They do not see Russia as an equal. I mean, they might, ha they might half-heartedly try to persuade the Russians of that, but they don't really think of Russia as an equal. They think of Russia as one more client state. They think of Russia as a place that has water and has minerals and has natural gas and has oil. They think of Russia as a place that has a dysfunctional central government, which barely extends to Siberia, right? So they are, like, they, they will talk up Russia, you know, to kind of humor Putin, but they don't think of Russia as a, they don't think of Russia as being like themselves. It's, you know, the Russians would like to believe that, but of course the Chinese, the Chinese don't. And so from that perspective, I think Russia's view about China's view about Russia is that it's a, it's a little embarrassing for Russia to lose. It's a little embarrassing because they're, you know, they're kind of our, they're our client, and so it's embarrassing if they lose. It's a little embarrassing that they're losing in Ukraine. But they don't care about Russians dying, and they don't, they don't really care. And you asked me for my view, and this is my view, it's not everyone's. But I don't, think, I don't think they care about Russia being weakened by the war. I think they like it. Um, I think they like Russia being weakened by the war because, you know, going, going, now, now going directly to your question, my read of that summit is not that there's like a partnership between China and Russia. My view of that summit is that China, China showed up in Russia and told the Russians what to do. And that's not a partnership. And as the, the longer the war goes on, 
the weaker the, the weaker Russia is. And so China will talk, like China talks about what's a multipolar war and this is just a conflict and so on. But I, they are profiting from the fact that Russia is getting weaker. And of course, they'll never say that out loud because it would offend the Russians. But it's, I think it's tr clearly true that they are profiting from the fact that Russia is getting weaker. Their, their deals with Russia on everything are better and better all the time because Russia is getting weaker. Um, and uh, so, the, I'm just, so, I mean, this is, I can't help but adding a point now about Putin as a, as a geopolitician. I think Putin, I've been, and I'm going to say this again because I've been saying this for a long time. I think Putin is a terrible geopolitician because if you are, if you are seriously, like if you cared about Russia, if you really cared about Russia and you were the leader of Russia, you would, you would, you would understand that you're, you need to keep a balance between China and America, right? You would always, or China and the West. And you would always want to be able to say, okay, okay, Americans, I'll go to China. Or, okay, Beijing, I'll go to Washington. And what has Putin done as a leader you know, since 2014 at the latest? He has made it impossible for the naive, decadent West to deal with him, right? There were so many people in the West who wanted really to deal with Putin for one way, you know, for natural gas, for whatever. And, you know, there was, you know, we, we tried to reset in our foreign policy under Obama. Like, we, people really wanted it to work with Russia. But he's made it impossible by invading Ukraine. And what does that mean for, you, for Russia strategically? It means that China is the only possible partner. And that's a terrible position. Because you always want to, like, if you, if you claim that you're in a multipolar world, why would you then want to be dependent on one of the poles? You want to be able to jump from one pole to another. But he can't do that now. He's, he's dependent on China because he's, he's, he's alienated us and he's even alienated the Europeans, which took a, which took a lot of work. So, I mean, I think historically, Putin is going to be seen not like Peter the Great or not like Catherine the Great, like not like who, whatever one thinks of them. They clearly had a sense of how to make Russia, right? They had, they, had, they, had, they, had a, they had a global sense of Russia. I don't think Putin does. I mean, I think he's made this terrible, terrible mistake of creating the situation where Russia is dependent on China. You know, and he doesn't have to like, and, and he, like this whole thing about the West, Russia and the West, it's so, it's so, it's, it's so, it's so fake, right? Like they, they know, Putin knows, Soloviev knows, they all know that the West is no threat to them in any major sense. They all know that, but they pretend it is, right? And they also all know in their hearts that China is a threat to them. They all know that, right? They know that, but they don't say it because what they're doing is they're having political careers and private careers, which have made them very wealthy and successful, which depend on lying about the West and being quiet about, about China. But if there, were, like, if there were a real Russian leader out there, that real Russian leader would be concerned about China. So this is, this is my, like, that's, uh, as far as China helping Russia, I think, I mean, I think, again, going back to Biden and how Biden's a good president, like, the, this administration has been, cons is concerned about this, and they're trying, you know, they're trying to make the Chinese understand that this could have economic consequences. And the Chinese regime is not, it's, again, it's not a democratic regime. It's not as unstable as Russia, but it's not a democratic regime. And basically, again, I'm not a China expert, so there are people who are going to have more informed opinions than me, but my intuition is that the Chinese Communist Party depends upon economic growth, and economic growth depends on exports. And so they're vulnerable to a world in which the Americans and the Europeans feel like they have to direct their economies away from China. They are vulnerable to that, more, in, a, in a way more than Russia, because Russians are not expecting to be richer every year, and the Chinese are expecting that. So I, I, think, the, I think that the Biden administration is right, and the Europeans should be paying attention to this too, to, to make it clear to the Chinese that if you do arm Russia, there will then be economic consequences to that. Um, that's that thing that I think is a line which we which we which we have which we have to draw um, So that's my long answer to your question